Hello and welcome back to the ROI podcast, the podcast that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment, coming at you live and direct from Mendoza, Argentina. My guest today is a very well-named man. His name is Ben. Uh, hopefully it doesn't get too confusing for you guys, uh, but he's the contrarian's contrarian writing the Substack, uh, the wonderful Substack known as the Contrarian Corner. Guys, disclaimer, nothing that we say here today is to be considered advice. It's just two guys, two Bens, having a chat uh, one on one side of America, one on the other. We're going to talk uh, geopolitics and what that means for the current uh, state of the commodities market. We're going to talk about, of course, offshore. You know, we have to oil and coal and then anything else we have time for. Uh, ben, it's a pleasure to have you on the channel for the first time. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. Thanks for having me. I appreciate uh, you having me on. My pleasure, sir. My pleasure. Uh, because you are a new time guest to the channel, if you would be so kind as to give us maybe a two minute brief overview of you uh, and your background, what got you into investing and what you would consider your investing style to be. Yeah. So I guess started investing, I don't know, 10 years ago, give or take, and started to take it a lot more seriously um, in 2020 with a lot more time on my hands with the pandemic and all that. Um, but spent a year and a half slaving away at a uh, public accounting firm and got my CPA, um, decided that wasn't for me and have been focused on my investments since then and started my sub stack about a year ago to write about commodities, stocks in the sector, um, basically macroeconomic trends, stuff that I'm seeing and what I'm doing with my own portfolio. So, um, I think it'll be a little bit of a confirmation bias. I'm definitely partial to uh, offshore services and the coal sector. Um, but I think moving into some of the things that I think are really interesting as far as like the uh, macro backdrop um, is a really interesting setup kind of heading into summer. So I figured we could start there before getting into the offshore services side of things. Um, indeed we can. So. Indeed we can. So as we look out uh, into the world right now, it, it... <laughs> It seems to me a lot of people are sleeping on the fact that we've got two fairly decent wars going on. Uh, one, I believe, probably has the the potential to get really, really nasty really, really quickly. What's your take on the current uh, Ukraine-Russia side of things? And then with everything that we're, that we're seeing in the Middle East, what's your take on the main factors, uh, main influencing factors that we'll have on the, on the markets? Yeah. So, I mean, you've got all these geopolitical things going on and you stack on like a 40s level debt problem, a 70s style inflation problem, tech bubble valuations coming off like a 40 year cycle of declining interest rates. So you kind of have all these things interacting. It's a really interesting setup, but I think uh, some of the stuff going on in Ukraine is going to be a good place to start. So um, I don't know how closely everyone really follows this, but it looks to me like Ukraine is basically on their last legs, and that's a very dangerous situation for everyone involved. Um, I don't think they have the bodies or the ammunition to keep things going for much longer. And that's even if the West continues to decide to uh, light a bunch of money on fire like they have been for um, years now, I guess. Um, but in the last couple of weeks to a month, you've seen stuff like uh, Anthony Blinken saying Ukraine's going to join NATO and then French President Macron saying, oh, we're going to send French troops into Ukraine. Um, and you just kind of see these like acts of desperation or headlines where it's like, yeah, it's not not going well over there. So um, one of the things that specifically has an impact on uh, oil markets is they Ukraine has been hitting Russian refineries with drones and depending on which estimates you look at, they, I think they've taken out anywhere from 10 to 15% of their refining capacity. So, um, I mean, just look at charts of Valero and uh, Marathon Petroleum or PBF, stocks like that in the last couple months. Um, I think some of them are up more than 20%, some 30% or more. So um, they've also started to cut production in Russia. So they're kind of joining uh, the Saudis on the production cuts. And it's... Uh, like there's a lot of stuff going on. I don't know how much longer Ukraine can hold out, but like with all that said, it's basically background noise compared to what's going on in the Middle East. So um, things like over the last week, it seems like things have been escalating, heating up. Um, 
from stuff that I've seen, it seems like Israel and some people inside the U.S. government are determined to start a war with Iran. So in the last week alone, they've bombed the Iranian embassy in Syria, killing seven high-ranking um, Iranian military members, including two commanders. And like you go back through history, there's almost like no precedent for like state actors bombing em embassies and like specifically targeting um, those. And it's just like a situation where it's like there's... Let me, let me just that thread you, you're putting out a lot of good info but you're you've touched on something very important es essentially an embassy is a piece of uh, the underlying country in a, in a foreign land right mm -hmm. so is this to be considered an act of war if it can be proven to be uh, let's call it these particular nations behind those attacks yeah if, if it's basically determined those deliberate it's i mean like there was uh i'll have to plug uh, uh mark walk who writes meaning and history on Substack? He follows um, all these ge geopolitical events, and Daniel Davis, who has a great YouTube channel on all the same topics. But they basically like they look through and went through World War II, World War One. Like you, you can go back hundreds of years, and there's basically nothing like this has happened. So. Um, if it turns out it was intentional, then it's a very, like, it's an interesting checkpoint for things heating up in the region. So I would say, like, I don't know what Iran's response will be, but I don't think it's something they're going to ignore, I guess is how I'd put it. So on top of that, you also have um, what continues to go on in Gaza. So they, over the last several weeks, basically destroyed the Al-Shifa hospital. Like, it's completely in ruins um and they intentionally targeted and killed i think seven seven aid workers um with strikes where like the aid workers they like, coordinated specifically with the israeli defense forces to basically say here's our route here's where we're going and um it definitely looks deliberate from some of the stuff i've seen so you have all this stuff going on that's just in the last week so i think that's part of why you're starting to see a little bit of a geopolitical premium start to get priced into oil. But um, I think looking ahead into the summer, there's, I think, an increasing probability that this starts to escalate even more. So so how important is Iran to the, in the scheme of things in terms of oil supply? Because uh, my take might differ a little bit on that but certainly one thing that does seem to be fairly concrete is the amount of persian crude that was in floating storage now seems to have magically appeared onto the market as a an extra uh, source of supply even though the us had obviously had sanctions on iran let's say let's hypothetically say things really go south really quickly how much of an impact does iran have currently on the oil market today yeah, so I guess touching on the sanction thing first, um, like you got to look, you can go back to Russia a little bit too. Um, that oil typically has a way of finding its way to markets and it is called gray markets, black markets, however you want to phrase it. But um, the sanctions, at least from what I've seen on the oil sanctions, they seem to be uh, more bark than bite. Um, and mm -hmm. the obvious kind of elephant in the room as far as Iran goes is the Strait of Hormuz and it gets talked about all the time but it's worth mentioning at least briefly um with something like that it's kind of a uh I guess a sil silver bullet like you can only use it once and that's a uh basically kind of a flipping flipping the game board type move as far as oil markets so I I doubt they would pull something like that unless things get really out of hand um but I, I guess I wouldn't expect like a material change in Iranian oil getting to where it needs to go, is I guess how I'd put that. So you see the bottleneck being more their ability to have influence over the um, ship transit routes, particularly, as you mentioned, Red Sea, Strait of Hormuz. Uh, presumably someone is backing the Houthis. Uh, you don't think Iran may have something to do with that? Well, I think... Uh... Israel's doing a pretty good job of making enemies out of a lot of different groups in the Middle East. And so, I mean, I'm not, this is not my area of expertise, but I think it's not like, I wouldn't be surprised if you have 
some coordination behind the scenes between um, Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas. I mean, all these different groups that are fighting in different areas. There, I think there's um, like it's kind of goes back to the common enemy where you've got Israel doing what they're doing. And it seems to me like they're trying to basically create something big enough that drags the U.S. into it. And I mean, we don't have a great track record in the Middle East over the last 20 years. So that's uh, some, something to be nervous about as far as that goes. So um, I'm not sure how it kind of plays out. I'm hoping someone can kind of walk us back from the ledge. But I mean, we have like just uh, what was it, a couple of days ago, we had um, UAE suspend diplomatic re relations with Israel. Um, and I think you're going to kind of continue to see uh, pressure be applied to hopefully walk this thing back. But uh, I mean, given the behavior of the last six months, I'm not terribly optimistic about that. So uh, yeah, perhaps one point we, we can agree on is I think we'd all like to see things calm down a little bit. Uh, in in terms of the shipping, it's not a sector that I've seen you write a lot about. And um, what I've seen your work based on is more to do with, I, I guess, the offshore services market. Do you have any exposure to, to shipping as such as defined by tankers, um, dry bulk containers, any of that sort of thing? Yeah, so I've looked at it a couple of times and it's definitely an interesting setup, but I kind of just view it as an opportunity cost thing where like, I feel I have a really good grasp of the offshore um, sector as a whole. And so I feel like I have a really good understanding there and with shipping um, like you can see wild swings and it's very differentiated based on like what kind of tankers you have or if it's container ships or, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different companies that have a whole bunch of different roles. And so for me, it kind of, got put in the too hard pile. So I don't have any exposure to the shipping sector, at least for now. Um, maybe there are people who will be able to convince me otherwise, but I've, I've been staying away so far. So, Okay. Uh, well, you know, we had to talk about it. Recently, we've seen uh, Saudi Arabia and their announcement that they're going to be reducing the amount of rigs contracted in the Gulf based, I guess, really on the same thesis that we had when investing in oil was that we thought that the Saudis did not necessarily have the spare capacity or the ability to bring that spare capacity online um, quite to the degree or the speed uh, which was expected. I've seen Bohr, uh, which is a stock that I own, disclaimer, uh, sell off quite heavily on the news. Uh, I'd be very interested uh, to get your take on whether this is more noise uh, than signal or whether you think it's a legitimate threat to the thesis of uh, particularly the jack upside of the oil field services. Yeah, I guess... The short answer is it really depends on your time horizon. Um, it kind of changes my outlook for 2024, but looking out to 2025, 2026, I don't think, um, basically if you have a, call it three to five year time horizon, I don't think it material cha materially changes things. Um, but I guess uh, if I could turn around here and back up a little bit on the offshore thing, I did have a couple questions for you. Um, so I guess just to kind of maybe paint a picture a little bit on kind of the big picture for offshore, um, I guess the question would be, how high do you think day rates need to go before we start seeing new builds for deep water and jackups? Yeah, I think that that is that is the question at the end of the day. So my my humble attempt at answering this, at least as of a couple of months ago, was I was uh, on my analysis, I've used 235K a day for jackups um, when looking at bore. My thoughts around the the drillers, which I'm I thought was optimistic. Now I start to think maybe I've been a bit conservative. But if you work your way backwards from the new build, let's call it 1.1, 1.2, and if you use the assumption that these guys, these companies are going to need a 15% IRR hurdle rate before they start to switch that capital from buybacks and dividends across to new builds, I'm looking at uh, I'm expecting us to get to 635, maybe 650 before we see any. Uh, meaningful increase in supply vessels that's that's just my take i'm not sure how you see things yeah i mean i've definitely seen different projections you have the uh people throwing out a million dollars that seems maybe a bit aggressive um i i would probably ballpark it 700 750 somewhere in there but i guess the question kind of follow-up is 
how long do you think it takes to get to those day rates? Yeah, good question. Especially when you can where are we at for jackups now for utilization? Um, it's in maybe ninety, you know, low nineties, mid nineties percent. Uh, I think that I don't think it will take very long at all coming into mid twenty twenty five when a lot of the the backlog is due to roll over. It'll be a question of availability then. Um, so from there, does it take an extra year? Does it take an extra two years? Because I always tend to be a bit early. I, my humble attempt would be to say maybe two or three years from uh, from today, given that Valaris okay. is mainly contracted. Uh, what would you say? Call, call it 2027, 2028, somewhere in there? Somewhere in that ballpark, I think, yeah. Okay. And then I guess the uh, going back to the new book cost of – Right, right now people are projecting one, one point two, and then maybe three hundred for a jack for a new jack up. I guess the uh, one of the things that's been floating around my head is like, I don't think four years from now we're going to be able to build a deep water rig for one or one point two. Like you look oh, this at, is the, this is the you look at, you, you kind of just like do this. Uh, I guess the what if math of right, you have inflation, you have labor costs, you have all these different things. It's like. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to be massively more expensive, but I could see 1.5 pretty reasonably as far as like new build costs. And then, I don't know, maybe 400 for jackups. I'm not sure if you have any Which thoughts. Would happen, uh, no, I, I can see it happening for sure. Um, that would be my my sort of bull case, base to bull case. Um, with the timing, I always have found just an observation in my own investing is that I've got a thesis and it just seems to take a little bit longer than I, than I think for, for whatever reason. Uh, so I tend to add a bit of, a bit of time premium there, but yeah. the way that we're going in terms of um, material goods, inflation, labor, um, all the factors that you mentioned, it's certainly not out of the question um, for the cost to increase by what is that 30% uh, from our estimates today. And of course that's going to have a significant impact as to what the day rates need to be in order exactly. to get the decision yeah yeah so that's kind of one of the things on the the what if side for inflation like i think over the next couple of years i think we do kind of see inflation heat up again so that's definitely something i've been watching um but i guess the other thing to think about too is like the runway that you kind of have you got kind of two different time periods the way i kind of look at it where it's like you got where we are right now and the runway to where we start getting new builds right and I kind of think that it's going to be at a higher cost and potentially farther out as far as time than um, some people might think there might be regulatory issues or might, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that can go sideways, I think between now and that, then. Is that also to do with just the, the sheer lack of availability in the shipyards themselves? And um, because they remember, they've got to do the dry bulk, they'll have tanker orders, they'll have containers. Um, and then they're not exactly friends with the offshore drillers, thanks to their oh, the their, last cycle to the last cycle. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's definitely on the cards. Um, how, yes. how can this thing go? Um, if we do really get to this tight you know, squeeze of a market, yeah, I mean, I think. I guess, I guess doing a quick detour, speaking of shipyards, that's actually um, a place I need to talk to uh, Trader Ferg about. He said he's been looking at that a little bit, but um, that's definitely an area of interest as far as like looking at that over the next couple of years. But I think if you look at the runway for um, the next several years, right, you've got, I think the fastest we start to see new builds like is probably 2027. And that's like, not like there won't be some okay we've got a massive wave like going through these shipyards um but i would guess you're looking at least 2028 2029 and then from there it still takes five years to build a drill ship and two to three for a jackup right so you kind of have like these two runways to watch for and you kind of basically look at where like what these companies will generate over the next several years like I know Transocean just broke the seal this week on a $500,000 day rate. So I think that trend continues, but I think you kind of see day rates continue to go higher, new builds basically non-existent, and it's just kind of going to be just stair-step along for 
at least three years and potentially up to five. I mean, there's it, it's hard it's hard to say because you kind of factor in the inflation too. It's like if you go it's out, yeah. it, it is a moving target. You can't just say, "Oh, I've got this prediction," and four years from now, like it's it's really hard to be precise. Like you can be, I guess, directionally correct with it, but I kind of look at it as like, okay, say two years from now, day rates are at call it average of 600 on new contracts. And in 2028, they'll be at 750, but then it'll be say 1.5 billion to build a new drill ship. It's like, well, then you're going to need 850 or 900 for something to really start um, for some of these shipyards to even consider it. So I guess that was uh, just one of the thought exercises I've been going through lately, trying to like, it's, it's hard for, like I have to be, I have to balance being like bullish because I obviously own these things. And I'm very excited about where they're headed, but you can't uh, get too far out over your skis with some of these things. So, yeah, indeed, which is why I've learned to always put a time premium on things um, because if yeah, for the factors that you mentioned. So let's invert that. What's gonna what's gonna mess our thesis up? What's gonna come out of the blue? And essentially, it needs to be some other means of production outside offshore space. And I don't think we have too many of those options that are viable uh, left or a big, massive disruption in demand. But for the factors, the geopolitical factors that you mentioned and the lack of capex, the, the lack of uh, investment in the space, it seems to me that even if there is a drop off in demand, it would have to be one hell of a an ugly situation in order to offset the the supply dearth. What can you come up with in terms of potential things that might ruin this thesis? Um, well, I guess the one easy answer to individual companies is you have like a oil spill blow up or right massive accident in some shape or form there. But I mean, I think that's kind of baked in. If you understand the industry, you're kind of aware that that is a possibility, but very unlikely. Um, and then the thing is, it's really hard to like try to poke holes in it just based on like replacement value on like what the cash flows are today, what they're going to be two years from now, what they're going to be four years from now, when you're going to start seeing new supply and where you see oil demand going and what's going on with the Permian Basin. Like if you look at like the Permian Basin just in general, like I've started to see different charts that it could be on its way to rolling over. And that's where I get nervous because people have been saying, oh, the Permian is going to roll over in production for been uh, on it for a while, two, yeah. two years. And it's uh, obviously hasn't happened yet. And you see some interesting government statistics, I guess I'll put it that way, as far as the way they're calculating oil production and all that. But um, one of the other, I guess, thoughts I got out of, some of the people I've seen on Twitter is that they um, were basically talking about the privates um, basically goosing their production in the last year or so to get acquired. And now that's going to get reined back in, um, in the Permian. So I think it's definitely something to watch for, but like, if you told me the Permian is going to increase production basically for the next two years, I'd be shocked. Right? I think at some point in the next two years, it's going to start to roll over. When exactly? I mean, I don't know. I mean, hopefully tomorrow, but I mean, it's it's hard it's hard it's hard to, hard to guess. So yeah, there just... are some, there are some consumers that might take the the other side of that. Uh, I agree, and I think that that does include natural gas liquids will also start to roll over, which have magically become this new uh, this new item on the supply side of things, thanks to uh, three letter agencies. So we can't find a hole in the offshore space. Then tell me this, Ben, why is bore going down? When I open my account and I see bore going down and I start shorting more puts and buying more, why is it going down? That's what the people want to know. Yeah, well, it's been a uh, fun week to be a bore shareholder, that's for <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> but basically, um, over the last week, you've seen Saudi Aramco um, releasing contracts from several different um, um several different companies. So I think they released four from shelf on Monday. And so of course, Bohr is down 11% or something. 
and then they released one from Boar yesterday and one from Valeris yesterday. And obviously, Mark was not a fan, but I think if you kind of zoom out and look at like where we're at right now, like oil is at 90 bucks. And if you kind of zoom out and say, hey, like where are we going to be for 2025, 2026? Like, I don't think, like if your time horizon is actually more than 12 months, I'm not too worried about it, but it does potentially slow things down for 2024 as far as the debt repayment, as far as the potential for um, increasing the buybacks, more capital returns, all that stuff. Um, but I guess one thing to note on the day, on the jackup that Boar had specifically, like the day rate was under a hundred thousand. So yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't like they lost um, one of their higher day rates. Like, I don't think it's that high of a hurdle to go and find a new contract at say 105,000, 120,000. I mean, even with some of the new supply. So I guess, I guess what I'd say is like, you start to dig through it and you're like, you wake up and you look at it, it's like, oh, there's another 6% or whatever. And it's frustrating, but that's basically, I mean, the volatility is just baked into the cake with some of these stocks. So I, I don't look at it um, as like a month to month trade. Obviously I could add better timing on buying it, but I mean, that's just how it goes sometimes. I still think fair value is a lot higher. I still think that they're basically going to be in a very good contracting position in a couple of years when I think they're 8% contracted for 2026. And I think that that setup um, specifically where they have shorter average contract lengths than deep water. Um, <clears throat> I think it's basically set up to be a huge cash cow in a couple of years. And the market's obviously going to shoot first and ask questions later, but I don't think it really changes where I think the stock is going over the next couple of years. So. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think, uh, for now, if you, if you, you know, if you, agree with the thesis it's a it's a buying opportunity certainly that's the way that i'm looking at it considering that i think it's gonna it's in a position to to have uh revenues or even, maybe even ebitda uh, roughly where its market cap is now um so i mean that just is too good an opportunity for me not to take a look why is valaris not suffering the same fate so valaris this week down like 0.6%, up over 11% on the month. Presumably, uh, the news is just as bad or worse for them uh, with regards to their JV with Aramco. Why are Valaris investors not so worried? Um, I mean, I would guess because it's more focused on the deep water side of things, just the mix of their fleet, I think somewhat protects them a little bit. But like you said, they are way more exposed to um, Saudi Arabia as far as where their fleet's located. So after Bohr had their jackup release, they only have two contracts in Saudi Arabia now. While uh, Valeris is at, I think, 18 of their, was it 35 jackups? Somewhere in there. So basically half. And yeah. of, of their fleet, I think nine of those are part of the joint venture. So um, it might be, I, I guess there's two sides of it where it's like they're more exposed to Saudi Arabia, but I think the joint venture also gives them a closer relation to, relationship to Saudi Ramco. So I don't think they're going to be out to screw them if that's what they decide to do with the Jack of Bargain in general. So I think that's, um, I think that's part of it, but you look at where Boar is exposed, where um, the sell-off is for their stock. I think it's definitely looks like an overreaction to me, but um, that's kind of, my my first reaction to it so so what are your thoughts around let's say let's say this happens let's say let's take a blend of your thesis and a blend of my thesis and say the contracts for Valaris 2025 midway 2025 the majority of those are due to roll over they roll over at higher rates let's just say that uh, essentially then that would feed into your thesis with bore at around 2026 Valaris would have done a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of uh, raising day rates and increasing fleet utilization. What do you think the cash flows on Boar or even the EBITDA on Boar could be to make it easier and, uh, and slapping a multiple on it? How much upside do you think there is from today given the, the recent sell-off? Yeah, I mean, 
You you would hope so, but looking at uh Valeris's contract and behavior over the last couple of years has uh taught me to be a little bit cautious with uh getting too optimistic on their activities. But anyway, um I I guess the way I kind of look as you kind of have this assumption of day rates are a little bit of a moving target. Say we go to average fleet, average across the fleet of 180, 200, or whatever it is. Um like, to be honest, I haven't looked too closely at, like, doing Excel spreadsheets. I kind of swore those off after uh, public accounting. But the, the the setup is, right, if we get, say, $200,000 a day in 2026, and that's basically where the fleet average is, or maybe even a little bit less, then what you're looking at is a stock that is definitely not below 10 bucks. Like... There's almost no way, just based on the potential for dividends, what they're going to be doing in a couple of years, what they're going to be doing with buybacks. Um, like, I think the, right, so they, they have the five cent quarterly dividend now and authorize the $100 million um, repurchase. So we'll see with Q1 if they're actually active. But like, I think what happens in 2026 is, like they'll make the capital returns program for 2024 look like a drop in the bucket. So. Yeah. Very good. Uh, so any final thoughts on offshore or oil services before we make a few comments on the producers, because obviously these things, the way that I look at it, they're, they're not a hedge as such, but the, the CapEx is going to come um, from the EMPs. So if we're thinking that oil is going to rise due to some of the comments that you made at the start of the, the chat today, how much should we allocate towards the offshore thesis when the EMPs are presumably going to be pumping cash at 90 to who knows, a hundred dollars plus oil. Yeah, I guess um, one of the things that's tough about like going through the producing companies is like, you have to like, for example, like looking at the, Canadian producers or the Permian producers, you have to go through and understand like, where is the company located? What do they own? Like, are they going to have basically be on the shale treadmill where they have to constantly reinvest? Or is it like offshore assets like Petrobras that are basically, um, basically huge. Um, like they have to invest a ton of money, but once they're up and running, it's just a huge cash cow. Right. So what I'd say is it, it kind of depends. And there are certain things that I look for that, um, like I'll basically just stay away automatically from Canadian producers, Permian producers, and that might be controversial, but that's just kind of something where I was like, eventually, if, if I start going to some of those companies, like it eventually bite me in the ass is the way I kind of look at it. So um, I think the setup for something like Petrobras, assuming they can uh, start communicating a little bit better is like you're still going to be getting dividends. You're still going to be getting massive production or not, not massive production growth. You're still going to be getting production growth and the potential for um, development of the Amazon region up there. Um, but I mean, the big, I mean, the big question mark for Petrobras is like, what is going on? Like who's, who's in charge? Who, 40, that, who's, 43, who's 43 million sitting in this uh, magical account that apparently no one knows what to do with. Uh, well, I mean, they know what to do with it, but it's like, if there's uncertainty about who's like, who's driving the car, like, no, like, it's something where I'm a little bit tempted to sell and move on to something else. But I guess the thing that's um, good about the offshore producers is that you aren't as um, tied to one region, they aren't as tied to um, a certain set of assets. Um but I, one of the things I think is funny about the uh, deep deep water producers is that you have like these uh, Twitter fights on oh, Valeris is better, Briggs going bankrupt. All, I, mentioned all these- this, I mentioned this in a, a previous interview. Someone commented uh, on Twitter, so <laughs> I think it was funny. Yeah, I, I view it like the uh, uh, the Adam Sandler movie where he's got the shampoo and the conditioner, and they're, they're arguing over which one's better. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you have. Uh, I think it was like in February and I kind of wrote a post on this in January. Where I was like, Simmons like really, really bad on energy and especially the offshore drillers. And I basically was like, 
look, if you're looking to add or looking to buy, like now I think is a pretty decent time. Um, but when I started seeing like, oh, rigs going bankrupt, I was like, okay, like it's going to take off like a rocket from here and like up 40% in like six weeks since then. So um, I think that's a interesting setup, but I think there's a lot of room to run, but um, it is funny to see the back and forth on, oh, jackups are better. Oh, like rig versus uh Valeris, stuff like that. So I guess uh, one of the things I should touch on before we move on is uh, one of the, I think, potentially most asymmetric trades in the whole offshore space, which is the uh, Valeris warrants. I'm not sure how familiar you are with those, but I can give a quick rundown if you want. Run, us, run us through those warrants. Uh, the strikes, uh, you've got quite a decent expiry. Tell us about that and tell us what your probability is around um, ROI on these warrants. Yeah, so... Basically, the way I kind of look at these is a super long dated call option. Like we've all kind of talked about the bull case for offshore. Um, they obviously have the mixed fleet, so they have exposure to jackups as well. But they expire, was it last day of April? Basically, end of April. I think it's like April 29th of 2028 with a strike price of, was it 131.88 cents? 131.132. So um, you can double check for me later, but the basic setup is all right with Valeris at 75 bucks right now, give or take. Um, I think the warrants were trading at 13 something this morning when I looked, but um, the basic setup is right. If we get this bull market that we're all kind of expecting, then the higher the share price goes past the 131 strike, right? The more torque you get versus owning shares, right? No one's going to complain if you basically triple your money with Valeris going to 200. But if Valeris goes to 200, the warrants go from 13 to what, like 65, somewhere in there, whatever, plus whatever the time value is. So, I mean, these are like rough, like back of the napkin type calculations, but like, if you kind of also throw in like the buyback program too, which I think is where things kind of get really interesting. I think they bought back like a little under 4% for 2023. I'll probably buy back a little bit more for 24. And like, if you say, Hey, like shares are going to go down, shares outstanding are going to go down, call it 15. I mean, 15% give or take, like just rough estimate. And day rates for deep water rigs are at, I don't know, call it 550 to 650 just as a rough estimate, like jackups are at 200 in 2028. Like the stock is not like, we're not sitting at 130. Like we're not sitting at the strike price. I think if that happens. So it's definitely something where there's more risk obviously, but if you get like the upside or the overshoot, then I think it's one of those things where it's like, like you don't see very many of those come along. Um, like one of the ones my uncle was telling me about was the uh, Occidental warrants, like in 2020. I don't know if you've ever taken a look at those, but they were like two or three bucks when I think Occidental was at like nine, nine or ten dollars. And so I think the warrants now trade at like 40. So that that's the kind of setup where it's like if you kind of see what's coming and you have this like super long time for things to play out, the setup is basically worth taking a shot so that's kind of one of the things i think is worth looking at but i guess the the biggest risk that i think um applies to this whole situation is what happens in an acquisition or a merger or stuff like that and yeah. some people i'm kind of in this camp where it's like okay you look at like the biggest companies the transoceans or valeris or noble it's like who exactly is going to come in and acquire one of those companies? Like I would expect Valeris to be an acquirer instead of right. Someone gobbling them up. But um, if they do decide to dilute some way too, the warrants, I believe have anti-dilution production. So um, I think. So what, if, what if Valeris wants to acquire rig and take on all their debt load? <laughs> well, I mean, that's uh 
I, I don't think that happens. I mean, the, the way I kind of look at Ripley. What if, what, if, what, if, what if the stock gets to $129 and they, they put an at-the-market facility out there just to, just to dilute the warrant holders? I, I mean, I don't, I don't think they're going to hose us like that, but uh, <laughs> nah, the the thing the thing about rig that's interesting is like you kind of have that torque built in just the regular shares with their leverage balance sheet and that's i think big. you have the best fleet and i i think you have the best management like they're playing a little bit more hardball on the day rate side but as far as like trusting management team like if you said you can only buy common shares you can only buy one like you have to close your eyes and hold it till 2030. Like it'd be Transocean for me, like no doubt. So that that's kind of the way I look at it. But with stuff like this, it's like I, I don't I don't get too committed to just one idea. Like I'll take a basket approach and just kind of be along for the ride. So um yeah, that's kind of so you're really saying that rig is better. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Settle the debate once and for all. Uh with that. Coal. Let's talk coal. I don't know why people just don't look at coal and do exactly what you said. You're buying a lot of these things for two, three, maybe four times cash flows. Close your eyes, take a nap and wake up in 2030. Uh, why aren't people so interested in coal, Benny? What's going on? Um, well, it's hard when you have the, uh, the music playing in some other sectors like AI and all that. But um, I think when you kind of look at um coal demand you look at supply you look at these companies and their valuations like i think if i remember right we hit record coal demand for 2023 we're probably gonna hit it for 2024 we're probably gonna hit it for 2025 and so on but um you look at the number of mines that have been um coming online it's basically like completely minuscule the amount of supply that's been brought online over the last like 15 years so you kind of have the same thing where it's like it takes a lot of money to get a coal mine into production, just like it takes a lot of money to drill, build a drill ship. And you have companies that, I mean, take Warrior, for example, and it's, I think, in the mid 50s somewhere. And they're sitting on, I think, $11 per share of net cash. And they're basically plowing a bunch of their um, earnings into developing Blue Creek, which is going to come online in two years, give or take, I think middle of the year, 2026. And I've seen different estimates depending on coal price. And I mean, it's, it's a commodity producer. It'll fluctuate, but like in like full year, 2027, you're probably looking at like 800 million in cash flow. And once that mine's up and running, it's like, they're not gonna have much to do except for buyback shares and maybe pay dividends if they still want to do that. But I think they're, basically AMR on a countdown timer. So, I mean, if you want buybacks today, like Peabody, AMR, of the, these other companies, like that's probably a better bet. But if you have a longer um, time horizon where it's like, I really think I can hold this for five years, then I think Warriors, Warriors is the place to be. And I think um, this is one of the things that has been floating around my head for a little bit as far as... Um, might be controversial for some, but if Petrobras doesn't get their act together as far as at least telling us what the plan is, then I think I'd be open to the idea of selling Petrobras and taking a good chunk of that and putting it in a warrior. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. I'm not sure if you're um if you favor other coal producers versus uh, warrior producers. Uh, I do. I do. Uh, I won't be I won't be selling the Petrobras that I have left, which is house money, I'll be sitting back and telling my grandchildren about that story. But yeah. when it comes to when it comes to coal, and this is why I, I wanted to to dive in. How many how many mines will Warrior have when this new mine is open? Uh, do you see any sort of concentration risk? I mean, they sell one thing out of one jurisdiction for might be five mines by that time. A very high quality, high margin business. And yeah, so what happens if there's a lack of demand for steel products in Europe, South America, Asia, if we get a nasty recession, are we going to get to that 800 mil of cash flows that you're expecting with Warrior? Um, well, I guess the, this kind of comes down to what your macro picture, what your outlook is. I'm starting to lean more into the camp of, uh, 
Cuppy's Project Zimbabwe. I'm not sure if you're uh, familiar with that whole thesis, but I mean, you look at you look at what's going on. It's not going to be like some deflationary recession. I think it's going to be more of a stagflationary environment. And I think you look at commodity cycles, you look at all these things. I don't think we're headed for some like end of the world type recession. So I think steel demand is going to continue to grow. Like you look at coal demand growth in India and China and like some of these places, it's not like there's not enough coal out there to meet it longer term, right? There are other people that do much better like projections like over the next one to two years. But like if you're saying, hey, I can actually hold this till 2030, like I think Warrior is going to be basically a money machine when Blue Creek comes online. They have, at that point, we'll have three mines. Um, I think the, if I remember right, the average, I think Blue Creek they're saying was going to be 40 to 50 years uh, mine life. And the other two mines, if I remember right, were 20. I haven't looked at the uh, financials in a little bit, but it's not like they're going to. That was going to be my, that was going to be my next question was a question around the reserves and, um... A fair bit seems to be hanging on the development of these new uh, projects, which um, obviously could do very well. Um, so you're not worried about a loss of production. I suppose a loss of production in one mine might only be out for, what, a quarter, a half a year, something like that. So in the big picture, it probably won't take a huge chunk. And... Well, I think you, you look at it too and just kind of pencil out like, okay, this is like high quality to where they get a premium to other U.S. coal producers. And it's, like low, low on the lower uh, quartile as far as cost to produce. And they have fairly easy access to export um, with their location, right? They're not uh, like Powder River Basin or something like Peabody. Don't have, to, don't have to drive over any bridges. Yeah, they don't have to deal with uh, like console and their uh, export terminal <clears throat> in uh, Baltimore. But um, I think you kind of look at like the setup on that. It's like, it really depends on like what your time horizon is, I think. And like there, there are people out there. And I don't like, I don't blame anyone for having different approaches than I do, but if it's like, all right, I want most bang for my buck between now and the end of 2025. It's like, if you're looking at Met coal and looking at the U S it's like, you're probably going to go with AMR. Like, and you look at the way that stock has gone over the last several years. It's like, it'd be hard to, hard to blame you. Like, and I'm still wishing I had bought AMR last spring instead of Peabody. But I mean, we, that's we, where we, hindsight comes in. So um, it's just one of those things where it's like, I kind of more with, with my holdings in Peabody and Warrior is like, I kind of look as like, this is a trade that could look like the tobacco sector did in 2000, where you have a longer runway than I think people realize. And if they're just going to, buy back and dividend out for five, 10, 15 years, then like, I want to hold the ones that are actually doing stuff to grow production. So it's uh, maybe not popular to with some investors to see these companies basically putting money back in the ground. But if you're actually looking at it and say, Hey, I'm trying to hold stuff for five years or more, then that that's the way I lean. That's what, that's what I look for. So um, I'm not sure, like, I know a lot of people like, uh, yen coal for the dividend and a lot of people have different approaches. Um, I do have some questions on like the whole royalty, um, set up for Australia and how that might get worse and makes me a little bit nervous on Peabody, honestly, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on the uh, royalty set up and if that's a, uh, um, cash cow for the government over there. Uh, it is, it is a, a concern and a cash cow for the government. And so, if the fiscal situation got worse over in Australia, it would be one of the first places they would look to improve their margins, shall we say? Uh, I think it's, I think it's probably a little bit overblown. It's probably one risk that might be good to fade in terms of sentiment risk. Uh, but honestly, I, I'm not an expert as to what that could look like because it would depend on the legislature and it will depend between Queensland, the state of Queensland, which is not a dual house system, uh, versus those with mining exposure in New South Wales. 
Um, I like Jan Cole because of the amount of just cash the thing has, the cash the thing prints, and it has reserves um, until the uh, green revolution may actually take place and displace coal uh, if that happens. So uh, I think Jan Cole is the, the unsung hero of the coal sector. And with regards to Peabody, my thoughts around that, around those comments might be that it's a little better geographically diversified mm-hmm. and I guess it sells um, a sort of different products, blended products. Elliot management will be gone soon, <laughs> sooner hopefully. rather than hopefully. hopefully. <laughs> so, so we can get their selling pressure out of the way. Um, and then presumably the thesis starts to work in terms of the buybacks and the, those are, those are my thoughts arch resources doesn't uh, doesn't take your fancy at all they seem i think to not get the press that they might deserve yeah i own a small slice in one of the accounts i manage but i don't own it personally um but i mean the, the way i kind of look at the coal sector in general is like you could pretty much throw a dart at any stock in the sector. And it's like, if you can hold it long enough, like you're going to do fine. Um, but I guess, I guess one of the questions I had, because I think you'd be a little more familiar with Australia is what you think of Peabody versus Whitehaven with them being a mix of thermal and met. And I'd be curious to hear um, what you think with Whitehaven digesting their recent acquisition kind of set up there for the next uh Oh, six months to a year. Yeah, um, it comes back to conviction around your thesis for coal. And I, I've changed my mind on this a couple of times. I've gone back and forth. I, I was a, more of the the inclination just to stick more towards the steady demand, inelastic demand is a better word for thermal. And so in that case, I, I like having a bit of thermal into the mix, even though it's obviously nowhere near as good in terms of margins for these producers. But I think that the inelasticity of the, the thermal coal uh, was what drew my attention to it. It was an easy thesis. I didn't have to worry so much about macro fluctuations. Uh, and then I started to think, well, hang on a minute. If this is all going where we think it's going, exactly as you mentioned, well, why wouldn't I want access to the higher margin uh, product? And, the, and the, that company that now has access to that has turned itself from thermal into Australia's biggest coal and 75% mix uh, met coal being, of course, Whitehaven. So um, uh, look, and I, I think it's like you said, I, I've taken a more of a basket approach to counteract the jurisdictional risk that you mentioned. Uh, to counteract the production mix, uh, the commodity risk, all that, all that sort of thing. And um, I think that I, if I could only choose one, it comes down to hor- horizon, time horizon. Over the long term, uh, I think Whitehaven is sitting on a brilliant, brilliant um, group of reserves for metallurgical coal that they bought for, let's call it two, maybe two and a half times cash flows. So will Met Coal be out of use? Will we stop producing steel in two and a half years? I personally don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, I think doubtful. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> never say never, but I, I don't think that's going to happen. From there, I think Whitehaven uh, then has the ability to fund shareholder returns. So it might be the case that people look a little silly leaning towards the Whitehaven side of things over the next one to two years because Peabody is in a position presumably when Elliot leaves to focus purely on shareholder returns. Uh, but over the long haul, the the coal that uh, Whitehaven has access to inside the ground uh, seems to be uh, the better opportunity with the, the caveat of jurisdictional risk. If it just looks too juicy, they are confined to Australian soil. And so that may affect, uh, I guess, their margins. If it affects their margins, what does that do to production? And we go down that that rabbit hole. Uh... Yeah. I mean, one of the things, I guess, uh, this is a completely, I guess, complete detour. But one of the things I actually started to look at a little bit was uh, Glencore and their complete heist of tax coal assets. Yeah. yeah. When they when they spin that off, if I mean, depending on what it's 
what the valuation looks like, that I think would be something I'd be very interested in. But at least for now, like I'm not like I want to own the coal assets. I'm not really all that interested in the rest of Glencore, to be perfectly honest. But I think it is cheap. So um if there's people that are more familiar with like the whole spin out situation, I think that's a interesting opportunity, but definitely one I'm watching too. So I think the Glencore are the the past masters of that. And I think that they're going to they're going to make an absolute killing. Um, yeah, should they eventually realize that spin off. Yes. Anything else uh, that's on your mind? Anything you really want to to touch on before we wrap up? Um, no, I think that covered most of it. Um, I guess uh, here's a here's a selfish question for you: Is there any um, anything you're looking at right now that we didn't cover is in an interesting sector stuff that uh stuff that I sh should maybe put on my radar just the uh, interesting ideas you might have okay so outside outside of what we've already touched on i think that people understand the opportunity in metal spaces particularly in precious metals uh, i think that people are getting it all wrong in terms of how they approach it from my viewpoint at least it seems to me that sentiment is all about getting this massive talk via um, these exploration codes that may or may or may not have metals uh, that'll be bought out at huge multiples to their current in situ value and all this sort of thing yeah and, pasture companies yeah 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 and look that could well happen and for those speculators i hope i hope it does but for me i look at the past performance even in a very flat, benign metals environment of wheat and precious metals. And I think to myself, why on earth do I have to do the extra work and take the extra risk when I think that there's an easy double uh, in Wheaton? And if I'm completely wrong about what's going to happen to the metal prices, this is not a metals company. This is a royalty on revenues. Clip the ticket from the top line company. Um, and I think I'm going to clip the ticket with this all the way up to a hundred bucks in a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you definitely like, you definitely won't get blown out owning like a royalty like you could with some of the junior miners. So that's true. But I think that um, uh, for a few reasons, I think you have almost the same amount of talk, which is a very strange set of circumstances. It's not supposed to be like that, but when you take Wheaton and you, th you think that they'll be hitting that, you know, comfortably hitting over 800,000, gold equivalent ounces and they currently only have half of their interest in production coming into what i expect to be a rising metals price you have talk to production increases you have talk to the metal price increase arguably maybe one or two times on the uh, the multiples but i certainly think you've got a an amazing opportunity there uh, given the risk reward factor i don't think it's going to be a 10 bagger um but i think that the risk of it dropping a little bit uh, in a 75% EBITDA margin business in a benign environment, well, what happens when production doubles? What happens when, you know, for every 10% that gold equivalent out starts to rise? Those are the questions that I'm asking myself. And so from a metals perspective, something different from energy for once, that's, uh, that's what's on my mind. Yeah. Do you have any uh, thoughts on, that versus buying the physical i've seen uh i mean the uh, ridiculous price targets are out there for everything whether it's oil to some ridiculous height gold to eighty thousand. i mean you can, you can just throw them out there but like do you have any thoughts on like the upside for say gold and silver in the next Ooh. five years I do. Uh, to answer the first part of your question with regards to physical versus producer versus royalty, I'd like to quote something, uh, promoting my own Substack, I guess, but it's not my work. I'm quoting the work of um, of Murray Stahl and Jim Davalos that looked at that very question uh, in a benign environment, so 2007 uh, to 2023. And so if you had bought physical on an annualized basis, you'd have made a 5.4% return annualized just buying physical gold. If you bought the producers, you would have made 1.1% annualized. So you'd be, you'd be backwards when you account for inflation and everything else. The royalties, uh, you're looking at rounded up, it's 17% annualized in a benign environment. So this is very much the 
the framework for me and to, as to what I'm looking for or coming into an inflationary environment, with the exception of oil, where that rule does not apply, the producers do have access to the extra torque. So that would answer the first part of your question. The second part, I don't know, man. It depends what they do with the monetary base. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I put a post on Twitter uh, yesterday when my, my Argentine pesos got delivered to uh, my apartment here. Uh, who knows what? It just depends on what happens to the monetary base. Uh, if that denominator keeps rising, um, I don't know. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, some of these silly sounding targets, they might not be quite so silly. Yeah. I mean, the, the more that I see happening with the debt and some of the stuff going on, it's like you've got potential for projects in Zimbabwe, but there's also like you look at history and wars and all these different things that we kind of talked about a little bit, like war is always inflationary. And if that's where we're headed over the summer, like that's just like another straw on the camel's back. So I don't know if it's the one that breaks, but I think it's uh I think it's basically the setup the to put it in like a sentence is own stuff that can't be printed. So yeah. yeah, I agree. And just be a little careful with the leverage because you've got to ride out the volatility until you get to the end of the cycle. And yeah. that's it's the one thing that stopped me from re-entering uh, the Australian real estate market yet. I am looking at potentially doing that when I get back is the fact that you really can't fix your rates to any meaningful degree. So you've either you got to pony up a lot of cash or you got to hope that you can manage that, uh, that cost of capital increase over time. Yeah. Well, I've time. heard, I've heard the home prices there are just out of control. Like if you want to live right. anywhere, it's not out in the middle of nowhere, you're paying a fortune. Uh, you are uh, certainly in the, in the capital cities, even in the regional cities over the last, I would say pre-COVID, um, they, they they really went through they really went through the roof um, in terms of nominal pricing. Uh, you'd be looking at eight nine times median salary uh, for for Melbourne or Sydney, and uh, Brisbane would be maybe a little bit less, but not far behind. So yeah, th things are definitely out of proportion, uh, but there are some some supply um, some supply issues. And, and now demand issues, given that we are importing sort of 700,000 immigrants every year without uh, an increase in infrastructure uh, through which to accommodate the, the new arrivals. So it's, it's, it's a big issue, certainly. Yeah, I think, uh, unfortunately, America has you guys beat on the number of people coming in. But I don't know if you guys have taken a look at what's going on at the border lately here. But uh, that's... Uh, I think it's going to be one of the main issues of the, of the election, actually, which we haven't really talked about at all. But I think that's a uh, like probably honestly number one. So I think it's uh, it's it's just going to be interesting to see how that plays out. So I yeah, and, and yeah, yet another inflationary force. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, I look forward to catching up with you uh, hopefully soon where we can perhaps talk about the the election and some of the issues that uh, might affect markets and, and the spaces in which we dabble. Guys, if you haven't already subscribed to Ben's Substack, the link will be in the description. Please make sure you like and follow his work. Uh, any final comments, sir, before we wrap it up? Uh, not really. If you guys are interested in my occasional shit posts on Twitter, I have a Twitter there where I'll be complaining about boar over the last week or talking about different things there. So it's a little bit less serious in my sub stack, but um, I try to enjoy myself with it. So if you guys want to check that out, feel free to go look me up there. Indeed. And the link will be in the description. Thanks for watching guys. I hope you have a wonderful day or night, wherever it is that you are. And I look forward to seeing you in another episode of the ROI podcast. Take care.